Okay, so welcome back for part eight of the first lecture. Part eight of the first lecture. How many parts is that? That's ridiculous. Isn't it? <laughs> um, okay, so we have done. Uh, what have we done so far, Pablos? What can you remember? Uh, we've examined the whole front end. Yeah. That means the parser, the syntactic analysis, and the semantic analysis. Yeah. And the previous part, we moved to the backend and had a brief look at how code is generated based on rules. Uh, yes, well done. My God, were you actually paying attention? This is very, very, very unlike you. <laughs> okay, so um, so we saw last time how we had some code that was generated, and uh, the code that we generated for this thing here uh, had um, what did it have? It had three registers, and we will see that if we do them in a different order, uh, where we do them rightmost, uh, rightmost first instead. Uh, then we get a better solution from this, right? So if we do, if we do one, two, three, we only need two registers to do those, and then we can reuse this register over here uh, when we do four and then five, and we've used one fewer registers than we had be before. Okay. So uh, it turns out that normally reducing the number of registers is good, though actually sometimes there can be cases where if you try too hard to reduce the number of registers, you may screw up other things, right? But we'll ignore that until later lectures. Um, so essentially, we've just uh, changed the reverse order. Uh, so so changed, changed the traverse order so that we're going to select the subtree that needs the most registers to do, right? Because if I do the one with fewer registers first, then I may not have enough to do the other one and that could be awkward, right? So if I do it with the fewest registers first, then we get this order down here, and uh, that helps us to do better, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the only other difference here is that we needed something else in our code to tell, to sort of free up a register once it had been used, because otherwise next reg would keep using the next mm -hmm. free register anyway, right? Okay, so that would allow us to get this set of code down here, which uses uh, one fewer register than before. Great. Mm -hmm. Pavlos, we've done our first optimization. Put it there, give me five. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we're going to look at another optimization, just something that we'll come to in more detail in a later lecture, but uh, this one is called common sub-expression. Now, typically, you're, you don't just have a single expression in the program by itself, you have other bits of code that have been generated before. And it may be that you have similar bits of code that have been calculated to do the same thing. So we see an example here of two statements, and you will notice, because I know how, how beady-eyed you are, how keen-eyed you are, yeah, you'd notice this already, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, because Cause, it's because they're in bold. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You will notice that uh, two of these subtrees are in uh, are the same. Okay. Now, actually, this slightly depends on exactly how these were ordered because obviously, if this had been parenthesized like that, then that would not be the case. But if we assume that they're parenthesized in the way that we would like them to be parenthesized, then you will see that we've got these two common sub expressions, and we can essentially avoid recomputing that part of the thing by storing this bit into a temporary over here. So we can eliminate this common sub-expression by calculating it once and then using the temporary there instead. Mm -hmm. Okay, And that makes our life easier and we have reduced by a little bit the amount of code that we needed to be able to write. Okay, So this is just an introduction to another type of optimization called common sub-expression elimination, for which we will need data flow, which we're going to come to in a couple of lectures' time. Data flow. Data was very exciting. That it's where that's where we're going to have to wait for two lectures time. I think two, maybe three. I can't. <laughs> okay. All right. So we've uh, so that's just uh, just our first couple of uh, couple of of optimizations, and uh, we're now just going to sort of wrap up the first lecture. And what are we going to say about it? Well, in the first part of this course, in the next several lectures, we're going to assume that we've got a single core processor. Uh, with uh, instruction level parallelism, registers and memory. If you don't know what instruction level parallelism, what does it mean? Actually, you do. Tell me what it means. Are you sure? Yeah, go on. Okay, instruction level parallelism is, means that uh, instructions are not necessarily executed in the same order as they're uh, appearing in the program. And the processor... Not necessarily or not necessary to. No, sorry, this is out of order. So instruction level parallelism is that... Uh, the processor is able to execute in parallel instructions that uh, don't uh, depend on its other's results. 
Ah, yes. Specifically, it doesn't mean that the processor is, processor is able to do it. Mm. It means that the program has instructions which are independent of each other so mm -hmm. that they can be executed in parallel. Mm -hmm. But but pretty good. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we're also going to suggest in this, uh, in this first part of the course in the next few lectures that the generated assembly code uh, shouldn't do any dumb computation for us, right? So we're mm -hmm. going to just assume that it does a reasonably good job. Uh, and we're going to fully utilize, we want to fully utilize all the functional units. What's a functional unit? Um, we know where this leads. Huh? Uh, well, I think, I think these guys should have done some um, computer architecture before. Okay. In this case, functional units are ALUs and floating point units and load store units. And branch units, branch units. Like that. Oh. There could be other things as well. There could there could be could be more complicated things. Basically, right? every subsystem of the processor that's responsible for handling some kind of uh, function or f f what's an ALU? An arithmetic logical unit. What does that do? That means it handles all arithmetic and logical operations like uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and uh, and uh, or XOR. Shifting and all yeah. that kind of stuff, right? Every, yeah. Everything that involves uh, basically uh, integer numbers or kind so of fine. things. Yeah, yeah. Um, and minimize the impact of latency. Mm -hmm. uh, latency is just how long we have to sit around waiting for things to be done, right? Mm -hmm. Basically, I guess. Um, and we are also going to assume that register access is fast. Uh, and that we have a small number of registers rather than an infinite number of registers. Mm -hmm. Most machines have a smallish number. Well, some, some risk machines have dozens um, and dozens of them, but... Um, depends. I mean, in practice, even x86 have a huge number of registers. Wait, 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 wait. Don't, you get, don't go into windowing and all that kind of stuff here, right? <laughs> OK, small number of registers. It has a small number of architectural registers. Yes. So we need to make use of them carefully, mm -hmm. OK? Um, and there are basically uh, two flavors of machine that we're going to look at. Uh, superscalar out of order. Hmm. What's that? I don't know, but it sounds super. <laughs> <laughs> What's out of order? So out of order is that the processor can execute the instructions in a different order than the one uh, required by the program. Why would it want to do that? Uh, while it's waiting for some instruction, long latency instruction to finish, it can go on and execute other instructions that appear after yes. the long latency one. So if you've got an instruction uh, later which has got uh, all of its operands are ready, mm. all of the things it needs are ready, but you're waiting for the all thing to do, mm. then you can execute that instead. Right? So, for example, if you have a load, a load that needs to bring data from the memory, yeah. you can basically execute an instruction after that as long as it doesn't, doesn't wait for load. that load. Yeah. Uh, and superscalar? Superscalar, that means that the processor can handle multiple instructions in uh, each cycle. Yeah, that's good, that is. We could do with some of those. Yeah, if, uh, if they're independent to each other, then you can just, you know, send them all away. Well, that sounds good, but what's a VLIW? VLIW is a very long instruction word. Very long instruction word? What's that, then? Uh, so it's a special type of processor with... Uh, Thing about superscalar, but uh, super wide, mm. ha can handle way too many instructions in parallel. Uh, but it requires us to uh, make sure that we can execute the instructions in parallel. Yeah. So the instruction contains all of the bits for the the, the, the big instruction contains all of the sort of mini instructions mm. for the different functional units, and the compiler is it's the compiler's job to. To work out what goes where, whereas in the superscalar job, the superscalar case, it's the processor that works out mm. what things it can do next. Yeah. So yeah, we need to know a compile time what can be parallelized. Yeah. And put every all these in the same huge, huge word. So the big difference between these two things is the difference between static scheduling of instructions and dynamic scheduling mm -hmm. instructions. So the superscalar one dynamically schedules instructions, choosing the instructions to execute that it knows are ready, whereas the VLIW one just does whatever the hell you tell it, and it doesn't worry about mm. doing the next one itself. OK? <gasps> right? Yep. OK, and we will much later consider multi-core architectures, mm -hmm. which have... Multi-core is uh, what? Multi-core. <laughs> all right, I don't know. I just, <laughs> all right, multi-core is fine. I'll, it's multiple <laughs> processes on one chip uh, doing the same, uh, operating together. Okay, so there we go.
Is that us? Oh no. Okay. So quick I mean, summary. I mean, for, for you it's different, but for the students who are young, it's Maltcore is the only kind of the only, the only thing they've ever heard of. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which for it's, me is different. It's like default. Yeah. Yeah. It? If you come out with one of your jokes about how I how I used to use punch cards. <laughs> Then I'll show you what I used to use them no, for, I, I, by punching I, I, you with them. I haven't said that, but I have. I have said that uh, you still think deep inside that pro shorts are made of discrete elements, <laughs> connected with actual physical cables. You, you dick, you dick. <laughs> okay, can, can, can you say dick? Um, I, I think are I you allowed? Did. I think it, but this isn't the BBC. <laughs> this, isn't like the, this isn't like we have to. Okay, uh, we'll have to put a warning on this for adult content <laughs> on the compilers course. All right. So to summarise what we've learned in the eight now parts of this lecture, uh, we have seen that uh, compilation is uh, translation and optimization. So we need to translate the code, but we also need to optimise it these days. Uh, we've looked at what a compiler is made up of. Uh, we've looked at the uh, phase order of the first uh, front of the front end with lexical, syntactic, and semantic anal an analysis. We've looked at a very, very naive way of doing uh, code generation at the very back end, and we have seen our first two optimizations, although we haven't really seen very much about them. Um, and uh, in the next lecture, uh, we're going to talk about what the coursework is going to be, which is going to be very exciting. Mm. Are you looking forward to that? Are you going to do that? Are you going to do the coursework? I no. think you should. I think you should do the coursework. No? No? Okay, fine. Um, and then and then we're going to look at the middle end, uh, looking at some optimizations uh, on just uh, scalars. Uh -huh. I love the middle end. Do you? Yeah, it's Excellent. the interesting part. All right. Um, and uh, I'm duty-bound to give a quick advertisement uh, for any of you out there who are thinking of doing a PhD. Uh, we have funding for PhDs uh, in compilers and stuff like that. If you want to work with Pavlos and myself... Uh, now that we've got this huge internet presence, uh, Pavlos, we're about to have thousands of people. Thousands. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how many people do you think are going to watch this video? Um, I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? Do you think me? Five, You're five, not even going to watch it, are you? 5,000. 5,000. OK. I, 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 I would guess probably 10. Uh, so, so we have money for PhD students. And if you would like to do a PhD with us, uh, please send me an email. OK. Thanks very much.